I would like to uh, get the record straight uh, in a way, and there should be no uh, misunderstanding uh, as to uh, my knowledge about what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an academician. This is uh, a figment, a figment uh, of my imagination, what I'm going to talk about today. But it is based on vivid memories I have had over the years. Uh, let me start with some, uh, with, with a myth, a Somali myth. A long time ago, uh, we don't know how long ago, uh, it, I, I believe, uh, I can be corrected, there are some other people also from the north, I'm from the north of Somalia, and uh, it, it, uh, it said that there were, there were two sheikhs. One was a great Muslim sheikh called Sheikh Yusuf al Kouni. He also has another name, and that other name is uh, Sheikh Barkhadla, same person. Uh, we know that he was a historical figure because there are, there are things that he did that in do, uh, including how uh, to read the uh, Arabic alphabet uh, with the vowels uh, in Somali. Alif Fatha, Alif Nasba, he Somalized that. Alif Lukurdibi, Alif Luhust Ribi, Alif La Gudi. So we know the work that he did. And uh, his grave, his burial site, is well known. I believe it's between Hargeisa and Berbera. Uh, so th the setting of this encounter with the other sheikh uh, is, I believe, also between in the area somewhere between Hargeisa and Berbera, two major cities in the north of Somalia. We always hear Sheikh Yusuf al Kouni was a Muslim sheikh, but nobody talks about what type of sheikh, sheikh uh, the other sheikh was. Uh, Bu'ur Ba'ir. Bu'ur Ba'ir. That was his name, but nobody goes beyond that. He was a sheikh. Okay, but a sheikh and what? And it's left to your imagination and guesswork uh, to, to try to figure out what kind of a sheikh he was. Or as a matter of fact, what, if, what kind of religion he even had. There was uh, an encounter between the two. And uh, not much is said about that encounter, but uh, the, the, the result of that encounter was that they challenged one another. And it said that Sheikh Yosef al uh, Ba'ir said, I can split that mountain. Uh, so it's like a duel. What can you do? Can you bet that? I can split that mountain. And Sheikh Yusuf al Kounan said, Okay, go ahead and split it. Uh, Bu'ur Ba'ir split the mountain and, and stood, you know, in the middle uh, between the two halves. And Sheikh Yusuf al Kounan made the two halves come together, <laughs> thereby killing Bu'ur Ba'ir. So that's how Bu'ur Ba'ir, that's the story. I, more than that, I think it's also said that he had power. He had some power in the area. Uh, I don't know whether he was ruling it, but, but he was a major figure in the, in the area. And that's where, uh, what brought about the challenge. Otherwise, there would not have been a challenge. It, there must have been a, a political confrontation or a power struggle of some sort. That's what I think. When he, he, when he was killed, his people, and, and I can't say his descendants or his children, but his people, the people for whom who, he was, uh, I believe, a patron saint, or later became a, pat a patron saint, uh, they, they uh, asked for blood money. Uh, in traditional societies, as you know, uh, if you kill somebody, if some, uh, uh, someone is killed from a certain clan, that clan is going to ask for blood money. Then they were offered uh, two options. One option was, do you want uh, blood money now, which would presumably be in the form of camels, you know Somalia is very rich of, in camels, or do you want blood money that will be forever, that's not going to end, that your descendants are going to collect? And they said, we want the later, we want our descendants to be able to collect the blood money. And that, they, then it was, the decision was made. And from then on, when a child, when a male, when a boy is born, he ever appears, you don't even know he is in town, you don't even know he is living in the area, and all of a sudden there is a, a Yeber standing in front of the house. And uh, he, he is given something. What he is given usually, uh, people uh, give because they, to placate the Yeber. The, the, the thinking is that 
the Ymir can put a curse on the, uh, on the baby, on the boy. So uh, it's a propitiatory gift. It's a placating gift. It is not like a gift that you are happy with. It's, it's like you want to turn him away so that you can ward off evil. And they live with the baby with the, in the house, you know, in the household, in, in the house with the parents, uh, something called makaran. A makaran is uh, the, in the form of a, of a charm, a bracelet, uh, to ward off evil. Uh, so that's the myth. The Iber, the Iberis are not the only people uh, in Somali society that are ostracized. There are other groups that also that are ostracized. But one thing in general about ostracized groups or out, outcast groups in Somalia is that they are a small minority compared to the rest. Uh, the rest call themselves edgy, and they are by far the majority in the country. So when, when I say, I mean sometimes we say we, me being one of the uh, offenders, you know, perpetrators of, of this uh, inhuman treatment of, of, of the Yebers and, and, and the other people. We, I mean sometimes, you know, slip to we instead of uh, saying edgy. So, but what I mean is edgy Somalis. So we have edgies on one side, and we have the ostracized Somalis or communities in the society on the other hand. However, there is a huge difference between Hebrews on, on, uh, on the one hand and the other ostracized groups on the other. Okay. The other ostracized groups among them being, being uh, uh, the Midgans, uh, the Tumals, uh, and there are other groups in the south, but mainly, mid, the, mainly the, the largest group, I believe, are the Midgans. They are also called the Gaboye. Uh, they are, in general, the ostracized groups are, are the craftsmen of the society. Uh, they are the artisans. They are the people. Uh, I, I once read in a book, uh, among Somalis, those that are technically superior are socially inferior. So in general, that has been the case. Uh, they were very important for the society. So the difference between the Yiber, as far as I know, and, and this, is, this is my observation, I haven't, I'm not, I'm not a social scientist. It's not a subject that I studied and come to uh, scholarly conclusion, uh, conclusions in. It is, it is my observation and it's also my imagination. Uh, what uh, this, uh, differentiates the two, the difference between the two is, the other ostracized groups have been defined and put in a box, and somehow that worked. Okay, you are this group, you do this, this is where you are, this is how you are, this is how you are going to relate to the rest of the society, to the IG people. It looks to me like that Yiberis defy definition. Yiberis defy definition. Uber edges are unable to put your parents in a box and say, this is how you, how, uh, who you are. And that's part of the reason why they are seen as mysterious people of obscure origin and people that may have some power that, 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 that's evil, kind of evil. Uh, uh, there is one myth which is really so ridiculous and I don't think people believe it, but you will, you will hear these stories related again and again and again. But I, 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 I can hardly believe that, that there any, there's anybody that actually believes that. And that is, uh, when, 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 when Yiberis die, okay, you will see people asking one another, probably not really seriously, have you ever seen a Yiber burial, a Yiber being buried? My No, I have never seen a Yiber being buried. Uh, why? Because they are snatched by a Hanfali. <laughs> and what is a Hanfali? You know, we, we don't have tornadoes in Somalia, but there is in the desert there is something similar to a tornado. It, it goes up it, almost the, fo the form of a tornado, but it is very, very thin, very thin, and it goes up like that. And we say, we, uh, the belief, the, the, the superstition is that there is some kind of jinn or, you know, some power uh, in there that's, that's not good. So. Yet when Yeberis die, they are snatched by a Hanfali. That is another superstition. Uh, superstition. Uh, I think one of the reasons that not many people have seen uh, a Yeber being buried is that because they spread out and there are not many Yebers around. You, it, you can hardly see a Yeber community in most of, uh, uh, most of the country. 
I think in the West, so for example, when you go to Hargeisa and west of it, like Chichilla and beyond, there are Yiver communities, but in most, uh, in, in, in the vast uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, most of uh, in most of Somalia, you can hardly see a Yiver community. You can see Yiver persons and maybe a Yiver family, but not really what you could call a community. And I think part of the reason for that is that the way the way they make their living, they have to spread out. Otherwise, there would be you know too many. Uh, if there are too many in one area. Then a boy is born. The, another thing that uh, it's not just a, a boy that's born. When a girl is married, also at the wedding, they come to the wedding and they are also given something. Both times, when a boy is born and when a girl is married, okay, there is a wedding and they show up and they are given something. It's to ward off, not to help the others. It is to ward off evil. Uh, uh, some. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I, w I would really want, uh, why did I write the book? I think, I'm sure that's a question that someone, I mean, people would naturally be interested in. Uh, I, the basis of my book, I would, I, I could say, I, it very are, is very strong memories I had uh, from boyhood, from childhood, about, about some years. I remember a time when we, uh, I, I was born in Aden, and we used to go back and forth but I started a school in Aden, South Yemen. South Yemen, it used, you know, it's a, South, it used to be called South Yemen. Now it's part of Yemen. Uh, Aden at the time was a British colony. And uh, in the middle, uh, late, in the late 60s, we left. Uh, we left Yemen. <coughs> uh, we left Aden, went to Somalia. And I went to Arigabo. And some of the people I met, I mean, uh, uh, brother, and uh, Hussein Ali Hussein is here. I haven't seen him in a long time. Very sorry. I mean, I haven't seen him in a long, very, very long time. I'm honored today. It's really, it's kind of emotional. Emotional reunion. So I went to Arigabo, and and Arigabo is is is, is a town I really like. The setting, the people, the landscape, the environment. <laughs> Uh, it was in my formative years, and, and, and I, it, it's, it's, I, I just loved it. So one of the things I remember, uh, and, and I'm sure Abdul Rahman and, and Hamid Abdul will, will agree with that, there was one particular year, one particular year, he would go to an area, we used to call it the stand, I think it's British, you know, where the, 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 the uh, cars and trucks are, are parked. Do they call it the, do they call it the stand? We used to call it the stanka. So it was kind of a parking lot, okay. So as you know, I mean, uh, the, the, the trucks would release uh, that engine, the burnt, uh, the burnt uh, uh, motor oil, and uh, you would be, you would see uh, pools of it on the ground. And this particular Yibir was mad. He was a mad Yibir, he was a lunatic. And he would shed his clothes, and he would wallow in those pools. Okay, and he would rise up, and he was a big man. He was tall, and he was very well built. Not 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 fact, he's very lean, but very magnificently built. We used to call him Yibir Washi. I don't know if you remember Hussein Muhammad. We used to call him Yibir Washi, and he would stand naked, and and that got kind of seared into you know, imprinted on my mind. Yibir Washi. Why Yibir Washi? There were other mad people in town. You, you never heard were Sengeli Washe, Nurbahante Washe, Musa Ismail Washe, Haber Chalo Washe. You never heard that. Why Yiver Washe? What does him being a Yiver have to do with him being mad? So it's loaded. It's like, he is a Yiver, look at him. He is a Yiver. And on top of that, he lost his mind. So it's like you have something exotic here. <laughs> anyway, another one was uh, Las Khore. So, so and I, I was going to school in Arigabo, and after Arigabo, after elementary school, went to Dayaha. It's still around Arigabo. Uh, during uh, uh, breaks and you know vacations, I would go to Las Khore and Baran in, in the east. And in Las Khore, there was a time when the, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, there was a public garden. 
and that public garden, uh, it was uh, constructed, it wasn't an old one, it was at the time, you know, the, uh, it, 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 it was uh, constructed, uh, uh, I think, sometime in the 70s. And there was one Yeber that was tending that garden, and his name was Ali. And we called him Ali Fakbur. His name was Ali, we called him Ali Fakbur. Uh, I think he was about 20 at the time, but he was, we, we thought that he was old, old. I mean, because we were young, young. And we thought that he wasn't that old. I don't believe he was, if he was past 20, he was like 20 or 21. Again, very, very strong. And the things I, I remember about him is that first he worked hard. He would come into town, get purchases, quiet. And he would walk away. I just remember him walking into the sunset, head, head, neck and back straight, not talking, rarely talking. And we would ridicule him. The children, now you know how children are. They don't, you know, they don't understand much. We called him Ali Fabura and we would ridicule him. And uh, the name of the boy uh, that the book is about is from that man, Ali. His name was Ali. And, 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 and the name of the, of the boy that the story is about is also Ali. Then, I, those were memories that were very strong in my head. But then, I don't think those two memories, vivid memories, buoyant memories, uh, uh, kind of uh, made me write the book. Uh, I went back to Somalia in 91 from New York City. And I got married and there was a wedding. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, there is a Yibar. A Yibar appears. He comes to us, and he starts uh, like uh, uh, making dua, like benediction, uh, praying, praying for us. And a number of us were standing. I was called from inside. We, we came outside, like, like the, the front room, and, and, and he's, and he's uh, like blessing the wedding. And some of us, I think including me, said, Amin. And there was a female relative of mine standing behind us, and she said, don't say Amin. Don't say Amin. Ordinarily, I would have, reprim I would have talked to her. I would have, to, I have absolutely said, this is, you, don't, you shouldn't say that. But however, what caught my attention was the face of the Yibber. The face of the Yibber. He had a face that, was really, that really grabbed my attention. He, he, had, he was like, it, it was like he was amused. And it, 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 there was a knowing smile on his face. So I forgot about talking to her. I just looked at him. Looked at him. And then the question was, what may, how, how does that face come about? And I related that to all the previous faces that I had of the others. And that is the background to the book. That's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I wanted to understand how that comes about. I wanted to understand the, psych the psychology of the Yibar. This is not so much a story as it is a portrait, a picture. It's more a picture than a story. So I wanted to build that picture, to build, it, to build it from a normal child, a normal child, to somebody with that face, the faces that I saw. How, did, how, did, how, how does a child, because all children, when, when they are born, they are all the same. How do they end up with that face, with that, that kind of character? And it's probably the picture I'm drawing could be a romantic picture. I'm not sure how, how realistic it is and how much it represents reality. And I'm not really sure of that. Uh, it comes across as, as it, it, it show, at least what the picture I have in my head and I wanted to uh, express so that readers would share with me is somebody that's extremely proud, somebody that's di totally disengaged from society Some, because he is not allowed any place in society. The other ostracized, ostracized groups have a place in society. The Yibir has no place in society. So that allows the Yibir uh, to disengage from society and also there is something mysterious and obscure about the Yibir. 
And probably that part that we Somalis do not understand is why the Yemen appears, at least to me, as extremely proud. I just see a measure of pride, which I'm not sure, the, or which I'm not sure other people, most other people see. And, and, and I believe that pride is coming from, it, it may be from an old, proud culture, and it may also be because he is not allowed, he or she, when I say he, I also mean she, he is not allowed to have a place in society that disengagement, uh, he has nowhere else to go but be proud and uh, be in his shell and, and be proud and be comfortable with himself because now he, is no, not, he doesn't form a part of society. There were technical challenges writing the book, especially this being, and I'm not going, uh, you know, I have to be very frank about this. I really uh, developed uh, hefty respect for people who write and can write very well because it's not easy. And uh, there were challenges that came uh, in front of me when I was writing the book. First of all, I, I already told you this is not a typical story. It's a picture that I wanted to share with you. And that picture may or may not make you happy. It's, it's, but but that's, nevertheless, that's the picture. There, there is a picture that I, when the reader finishes the book, I want him or her to see, I want the reader to see what I see in my head. And if you don't like it, I don't like it either, by the way. <laughs> I don't like that picture either. But that's what is in my head, and that's what I, what I want to share with you. It is by no means a happy story with a happy end. It's not. I wish I could, but then I would be lying to myself and lying to you. Uh, I have to create uh, a, a protagonist that I could relate to. So he, Ali is somebody that has, has gone to school, and uh, Ali, uh, and, and, and he's very intelligent. I don't mean that I'm intelligent, but he's very intelligent. He's somebody that can really reflect, especially as he grows up, on their situation and think very critically. Uh, he also has a talent that I have never had, although I wanted to have. Muhammad Sheikh Dal Maranna, and and they know, say no. He he was, a, he is a good soccer player. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, I was, never was a good soccer player. I was not a very sports. But however, I used to go with the team. Muhammad Sheikh Dal was part of the team. He he was a player. I was not a player, but I would go with them because I would go, I would be on the sidelines and I would be shouting my heart out. <laughs> like I'm doing now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing is, so the, the focus is on that picture, on, on, the, on the build up to that psychology, to that final phase that I want to get to. That's the target. So what is guiding me is, that's what is guiding me. The plot, is, it's like creating itself. So, the, but the focus, there is a target. And another thing that I would like you to know, and the, really, it, because it, when the reader is, when a reader opens the book and he or she knows nothing about the Everest, it's very hard, you know, you can't expect anything. Nothing in the life of a Yiver takes its natural course. People sometimes expect something is happening, also this is what's going to follow. It, it, it may not happen. Because the life of a giver is different. The life of a giver is unfinished. So sub, there are subplots that may not have been as developed as you would like them developed. Because my focus was solely on, on, on the build up, on that psychology, and how it's uh, coming, you know, until the end. How the psychology, the face of the giver, the faces that are seared in my mind, uh, how, they, uh, how they, th those faces come about. Technically, one difficulty that I believe all people that write in a different language than the language of that culture they are writing about is, uh, especially when you consider the Somali society, which is an oral society, until recently, until the, uh, you know, uh, Somali language was not uh, a written script before, like you know, the middle, uh, the mid 70s or early 70s. It, so all those stories were in our heads. Okay. 
So in an oral society, a lot of times what happens is that the people that really know the language well are the people that, who, who are those people? They are the people that have not gone to school, that live in the countryside. Those are the people, the, the nomads, the people in the countryside, the people who live in the, that live in the small village. Those are the people that speak some pure Somali, Somali very well. And when I say pure Somali, I don't mean, uh, you know, uh, some dialects are not pure and others are pure. But whatever the dialect you are talking about, usually it's the rural people that speak the language well. And we know when you are writing a story, how do you present your characters? One way, one principal way, the key way to present characters is through how they speak. Okay, so how can you present somebody that has never been to school and at the same time uh, make them talk like they are from Oxford? I mean, how, how, how can, what is, what is the reader going to think? So that's one challenge. The other challenge is, when I was writing the book, I was continually, there was this struggle, this, this conflict in my head. Okay, should you be, like fidelity to the reading, the reader, in, in the sense that, do I make the reader happy, okay? Or do I, do I be loyal to the culture? Sometimes there is a struggle. And I hope what I have done mostly is be loyal to the culture, fidelity to the culture. That was very prominent in my head. I could have written uh, a book with a happy ending that would make the reader is happy. But that's not really how the uh, uh, book was unfolding. So there was this, I felt that there was this conflict between me and the reader. Between me and the reader. What would reader, what the reader would like and what me, and in a way I'm also a reader. I'm also a reader. What would make the uh, reader happy would also make me happy. However, it would not be intellectually, it would not satisfy my imagination. Because what I'm looking for, okay, in the end is that face. How do I, uh, how do I start with a young boy, okay, and end up with that face? That, 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 that I have seen over and over again. Okay, having said that, and if you have questions, please go ahead and interrupt me. Uh, it's a good uh, point to interrupt me if you have questions, otherwise I will go and read some passage from the book. And if, the, if it takes too long, please let me know, okay? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Somali camel boy, I, you know, I speak and I speak and I speak and sometimes there is no stopping me. Yes, Mahmoud. Mahmoud, uh, <clears throat> according to your narrative, uh, the, the, the origins of the Yiburis are from Burbay, which is invariably a Somali. The, the, uh, when we, the Yibir is a, is a single, uh, it's a, it describes one person, but the plurality of, of the Yibir society is called Yibro. Yibro, yes. Which essentially, uh, there is another narrative that says that Yibros are, are of Hebrew origin. Are you referring to that possibility in here, or is it something that will, you will exclude? What I, what I can say is that my own thinking is that why the conflict to begin with? Why, 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 why do people think, for example, uh, this man was praying for us, was blessing us, okay? And we were not allowed to say amin. Amin, by the way, is amin. Amen in, the, uh, in, in Arabic it's Amin, and Amin is the same thing. So we were admonished when we said uh, Amen. Why? I mean, what is the origin of that? My thinking is that originally probably they had a different religion. What that religion was, I don't know. Why the conflict? Why would we, we know a lot of myths. Okay, they have a grain of truth. And the myth is built around that grain of truth, okay? For the, if there was a conflict, why was, there, well, why was there a conflict? I mean, such a big conflict. That's my thinking, but uh, one of the difficulties, the challenge to understanding the reality of the Yiber, uh, and, and, and uh, Yibro, and he's absolutely right, and the, uh, the plural is Yibro. One is Yiber, and Yibro is the uh, plural, is that they have not been given any reason to trust anybody out of, uh, outside of them. Probably now I can, I mean, the, the book, the word, word of the book has gotten around. Maybe if I go to Somalia, I can, and I have uh, talked and met some uh, 
educated Yemeni. Some of them are very educated. I, I have met some of them, and we, I have I have contact, I have, uh, you know, communication with some of them. And if I go back to Somalia, I believe, especially in places where there is a community, a Yemeni community, okay, I, I, I think I probably can make some headway in understanding the story from their perspective. But they have been not given, they haven't been given any reason to trust anyone from outside. By the way, another thing that I, I, I should have added is that Las Burgabo is a made-up name. The setting is really Arigabo, which is a town that I know well, uh, Arigabo and its surroundings. Uh, but I didn't want to put all that blame on the, uh, on the town. It would be too much. So I had to divide it. So uh, Las comes from Las Ano, the Las Quray. Uh, Bur comes from Burho, another town, another major town in the north. And Gabo comes from Arigabo. Uh, but Arigabo is the real setting. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to read some passage, um, uh, and please, uh, yeah, you, you stop me if you think it's taking too long. Uh, a subplot in this story is that Ali grows up not knowing. He, have, he has never seen his mother. He knows that he had siblings, but he hasn't seen them. He doesn't know what happened to them. His father, di his father died when he was about nine. He's being raised by his sister. They, 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 they live in an isolated hut that their father built with his own hands. The father died, so he's, and she's, I think about, I haven't read the book in a long time, and, and, and believe me, when I go back sometimes, you know, I, I feel a shudder, so I don't read it often. I really don't go back to it, I read it, and, and that's true. I had to remind myself on that. So I don't know how old she was, probably she was about 17. 17. Okay, she was 17. Uh, and uh, when the, their father died, and Ali is nine, so she, she is raising him. And uh, so Ali doesn't know about his mother. He doesn't know about his siblings. But he kind of knows he had, there were siblings, and, and there was a mother. Of course there was a mother, but he knows there are the siblings also. And whenever he asks about them, he is told, pray for them. They are in heaven, pray for them. That's what he's told. But he doesn't know what happens to them. So I, he, has, he has this feeling that something happened, but he doesn't know what it is. So there is, this is one time when, when he, has, uh, he has encountered a number of setbacks. So one night he goes out of village, he, he goes into the wilderness, he comes back raging. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and he comes back to his sister. One evening, Ali walked out after supper without telling Amina where he was going. About an hour later, he stormed into the house raging like a bull. Tell me, tell me, he shouted. No, Amina cried, you are not ready. She knew what he was talking about. It was their first reference to what to him was a suffocating mystery and to her a painful secret. I need to know I want to know, he said plaintively. Patience, patience. You are not ready for the truth. You have been dealing with it for so long. Why can't I? I can deal with it because I have lived it. You see, with me, there has never been a choice. It was forced on me. But you have left me in the dark. I want to break out of it. I want to be free. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. It is only a matter of time. <coughs> okay. Here, something that I really loved, and uh, again, uh, my friends uh, know I liked to watch soccer. I used to go with the team. I still love watching soccer, but I was never good at it. I was, I was lousy when it comes to sports. Uh, so this is, Ali becomes a star. Two things really help him in his early years. Two things. One is he was very smart, very intelligent, very smart. And there is a lot of respect and prestige that go with that. 
Muhammad Sheikh Dalmar knows because um, both both of them, especially Muhammad, because he was one very bright uh, kid, Muhammad Sheikh Dalmar. Uh, very a lot of prestige that that, uh, that 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 goes with that, and he was a star soccer play, a player. So that also got him uh, some measure of respect. So today there is a game between the team of his town and another town, or his province and another province. Few tea shops were open, and almost no customers could be seen in them. At one street corner, two elderly men in turbans squatted. At one street corner, two elderly men in turbans squatted on the ground and played shah. I'm being told that shah is also played, it's, it's like an old thing among Hebrews too. Shah, I, I have been told it's called. Shah, and we call it shah. At the approaching sound of heavy steps, one of the men looked up only to see a grown man in shorts. So this is Ali walking towards the stadium. He squinted in puzzlement and shook his head in disgust then looked down to make his next move. Near the center of the town, Ali was joined by two of his teammates, one like Ali wearing a red jersey with white stripes, the other wearing the, the traditional black jersey of the goalie. They could see people moving en masse toward the stadium. A mad woman with a game foot hobbled forth, using a long shaft for support, and moved fast. She sang an old war song. She knows there is a game and she thinks that it's a war. She's a mad woman. She sang an old war song that in the olden days women sang to cheer their men on on in battle. Ali and his friends looked at each other and laughed heartily. Suddenly the mad woman stopped and stood erect like a squirrel. You laughing at me? She asked. Laugh at your own mother. <coughs> then she continued to limp and sing, not caring to know who the men in shorts were. So she is singing because of the game, and these men, these men are going to play in the game, but she has no idea what, who they are and what they are going to do. Closer to the stadium, the alulation and the singing and the drum beating gave a fitting prelude to the game. The lines were still long, and there were many policemen manning the gates, keeping their eyes on the swelling crowd. Packs of children chirruped like excited birds and hovered around the gates. A number of government land rovers guarded by another group of alert policemen were parked outside the stadium. All in all, the atmosphere and the prevailing mood were those of a joyous fiesta. The opposing players entered through the side doors and went into their respective rooms. Ali and his two companions were the last to arrive, having gone over the plan with all the players the day before the coach used ten minutes for a pep talk. He reminded his boys of the stinking defeat the province's team had suffered the year before at the hands of today's opposing team. Ali had been deemed too young. By the way, he is still too young. He's the youngest players. He is he's the youngest player on the field. He's, he's young, but he is highly talented and an excellent soccer player. Ali has been Ali had been deemed too young to be on that on that defeated team of the year before. But the defeat was a defeat for the entire province, no matter how, who had been on the team the year before. The moment of truth was near. Some of the players prayed silently. Some kept to themselves and assumed solemn faces. Others affected merriment, laughed, and poked fun at one another. Ten minutes before the game, before game time, they all took to the field. The air was still, and it was a warm and sunny day. The bright sunlight shone on the brilliantly colored dresses of the women. The singing and the shouting and the drum beating rose sharply and excited the players and the crowd even more. The governor and the mayor and the high-ranking government officials were present. Men and women, young and old, were there. And it seemed that all the children had managed, after all, to get into the stadium, filling the stands with bird-like warbles 
and sparking, uh, sparkling eyes on cherubic faces. On the field, the players trotted, sprinted, and stretched and hopped up and down. The opposing teams intermingled. Some shook hands and talked. When it was time to start the game, the 22 players took their positions on the field. A shrill whistle signaled the start of the much-anticipated game. The supremacy of the visiting team was soon evident. Its players seemed better conditioned, and they had a playmaker, Saeed, who was strong, energetic, and creative. The midfielders of the, of the town's team were no match for Saeed, and unable to feed the forwards and the wings. Playing left wing, Ali saw little of the ball, and he could not roam the field or be creative with the ball as he would have liked. Fifteen minutes into the game, Saeed received the ball in the middle of the field. Dribbling around two opponents, he passed the ball to a teammate running alongside him. Saeed then slipped through the line of defenders just in time to receive the ball with his left foot and shoot, and shoot with his right. A classic goal. The coach had to make a decision, a quick decision, because it was clear that Saeed's creativity was take, taking his team apart. He decided to play the only card. He, he decided to play the only ca card he had and switched Ali to midfield. Ali was not as strong or seasoned as Saeed, but he was faster. The town still <coughs> soon settled down and began to play with more poise and precision. And the game began to turn into a duel between Ali and Saeed. The crowd sensed unfolding drama. There was the time when Ali stole the ball and maneuvered between two players only to find Saeed in his path. The trick that Ali played or the more seasoned player left the latter ridiculously contorted and brought a roar of approval from the crowd. But then Ali, having not given up the ball quickly enough, lost it. At that moment, at that moment, Ali's captain, who had been expecting a pass, got into Ali's face. Stupid yiver, he said. Stupid yiver. Only Ali could hear what the captain said. Cut to the quick, Ali froze in his tracks and stared at his captain in disbelief. For a moment, he stood still. The comment had jarred him to the bone. The sanctity of this sport had just been violated. His last refuge had been invaded. On the grandest stage of his life, he was being dumped like trash. He could never have imagined such naked insensitivity, let alone being prepared for it. Alas, the sport he had loved and that had given him so much was not the sanctuary, the sanctuary he had thought it was. He looked around and saw not fellow soccer players and a cheering crowd, but poisonous. Vipers. They had already destroyed his dreams, and now they wouldn't let him keep his one remaining passion. Only one thing remained for him to do. He walked off the field. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip what he is thinking when he leaves the stadium. Because probably it's going to take too long otherwise. So what happens is that when he comes back, okay, he goes into the wilderness again. And his sister hears about what happened. She's waiting for him at home. He comes back. For two hours, Ali traipsed the wilderness in the dark. He felt curiously relieved and at one with the nocturnal beasts. A little before nine o'clock, he returned and found Amina, that is his sister, sitting on her mat. The mat is different from a mattress. I don't know if I... It's, and it's a homemade uh, mat uh, made from long leaves. I, I don't know what it's called in English, but... There are trees that like, look like palm trees, 
long leaves and you can weave. Women know, Somali women know how to weave that into a mat and, and it can be, uh, you know, that, that's what uh, rural people used to, at least in the olden days, uh, sleep on. She looked serious. He knew that she wanted to talk and he braced himself for a sharp reprimand. Sit down, Amina commanded. I will fetch you a cup of tea. He sat on his mat. She went, to the, she went into the kitchen and came back. They, they live in a very simple house, so there isn't much of a kitchen, you know. She went into the kitchen and came back with a cup of tea. He began to take a sip. Ali listened carefully. I mean, I started, I'm about to tell you something I have never told you before. Raising his eyebrows, Ali, uh, raising his eyebrows a little, Ali eyed Amina with curiosity. She probably received a proposal for marriage and wants to share it with me, he thought. A knowing grin showed on his face and eased his tension. It's about time you were told the story of our family, explained Amina. She then coughed slightly. Remember the cough. Remember the cough. Ali nearly jumped out of his skin and almost dropped the teacup. Could the gaping hole collapse? Could the dead come back? Could the dead come back and talk? His eyes bulging, lower jaw dropping, mouth gaping, he looked at Amina in disbelief. The story of his family had until now been off limits to him. His family was one with a dark side, a story he had always viewed with dread, both dread and desire. Now was the moment when the past would be illuminated. Now was the moment when his existence would begin to make sense to him. Now was the moment to enliven a part of him that had grown stunt, distorted, diseased, unreachable, and very, very dark. Yet when that moment of a lifetime was finally upon him, he was totally unprepared. What is she going to say? He girded up his loins and with a bated breath waited for her to begin. Amina coughed. Remember the cough. Amina coughed again and held her, held her chest gently. She waited for the irritation to subside. Then in a sober and even tone, she began to tell the story of the family. A long time ago, in the year of the red, of the red dust, Sigase. And for that, you will have to read the book. <laughs> okay, uh, this coming, this segment, Ali at some point becomes an activist. And he brings his neighbors in town together, in his house, in, the, in their house, he's, he's an Amina's house. And he has some idea, some proposal for them. So they are now in that house. It's isolated from the village, from the town, isolated from the village, uh, from the town. We have Somali din Adawi, we didn't ask you again. Those from Arigalo, you know. I think it's like Gerarina. Only the three of us know. <laughs> From, from Arigao. Anyways. <laughs> okay, okay only, three, only three of us probably. Oh, no, yeah, there are some others that may know. Anyway, anyway. It, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. It feels good to be a part of a small group. That, that's the only group that knows. You know, right? In a way. So now they came together. They are congregating in that house. Yeveris. There is an old man that whose appearance is very deceptive. He's old, he's not cared for, he is dressed in tatters, in rags, 
His hair is in locks, and he looks very bad. Not, 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 not his physical features, but because of lack of care. However, he's very, very intelligent, and he's the most senior ever in town. So they are congregating there, and there is a wind blowing. <coughs> Some of the Yibbers sat cross-legged. Others wrapped their sheets around their backs and shins for support. Some stared down, also drawing lines in the dirt, lines they couldn't see clearly in the dim light. The women sat in utter silence, wishing they could see well enough to watch the faces of their men. But in the semi-darkness, the faces of the men stood out like apparitions. Ali's eyes shifted back and forth between the faint flame of the pendant lamp and the macabre faces of the men. Outside, a wind gathered force and began to howl. Ooh, it literally, wind can, you know, sound like that. <laughs> Gura began, Gura bent his shaggy head. His hoary locks fell to veil his face. For a while, he remained silent. Then he let out a deep rising moan before the words poured out. Gure is the old man. We were once a proud race. With a practiced tongue, Gure began to tell the story. The silent Yiberis watched the bowed old man and heard his powerful voice. In him, they found the deeply buried side of themselves. He was their collective soul, their collective conscience, their collective voice, their collective heart, and their collective past. And this shared experience, suddenly visceral and powerful, whipped them into one cohesive mass that was now centered on the old man. Gura now had the power to steer and teach bleeding hearts and crying souls. In the voice of a mystic, he led the group on a dark trail and into a deep hole of sadness. Gradually, centuries of trials and tribulations began to take shape. The stolid faces of the hardened men and women broke. Tears came and caught down many a cheek. Ajis reject us no matter how good we are. We stay at the fringe of society and deal with Ajis only if we have to. We do not show them how we feel and we never grovel for help. Endurance is our strength. Solitude is our refuge. We seek safety in silence, but we are not made of stone. Yes, we are bitter. No human deserves to be treated like the scum of the earth. But this is all the life we know. I just do not know us. They see us as a big, they see us. They see us as a big mystery. And they, don't, and they do not quite know how to deal with us, except to keep us down and out of sight. And out of sight, we stay. For centuries, I just have wanted us to vanish. But here we are, bowing only to God. Let fools amuse themselves. We are inferior to no one. I'm old, very old. Only God knows how old I am, and how many years, months, or even minutes, days, or even minutes, I have lived on this earth. Think very seriously, and very deeply before you act. We want to own land. Who will give us land? If the government gives us land, who will protect us from edgy predators? Yes, we own little, but we know how to survive on what little we own. Sons and daughters, it will not be easy. Think carefully before you act, because we cannot afford to lose. Guri paused, as if to let the howling wind go do the talking now. The faint pendant lamp swung back and forth on the walls, on the faces of the men, and on the men's faces. Shadows bounced and danced eerily. On the walls and on the men's faces, shadows bounced and danced eerily. 
The flimsy walls of the house stood and fought against the howling wind, and the Ibers wept for their golden past, attuned to a connection between the distant past and the howling wind. The spirits of dead Ibers seemed to hover around the dying lamp, around the dying lamp, and the dead Ibers who in life had never had a voice seemed to have found a forceful one in the howling wind. An unmistakable pall of fear descended upon them then and showed through eyes held wide on mournful faces. The women could only lean on the elemental power of womanhood. Elemental power of womanhood. I, I believe there is some power that women have that men do not have. Yeah, yeah. Men, the power that can make them cry. The, mad, the power that can make women understand the pain that others are feeling that men, many men, all the destruction throughout history on, on humanity has, has, was, has been brought up by men. Something that women have that men do not have. That's what I call the elemental power of womanhood. It's not weakness, it's power. And Gure, like a rock, sat motionless. This is the last passage that I'm going to read in, if you so choose, I can read the end also. That's up to you. Uh, okay. As a result of that meeting, we had a dictatorial government. If five people meet, they can, go, they can be taken to help, basically. Why did you meet without us knowing, without somebody from the government being there? Because they met, and Ali was the leader. Ali was arrested and was sent to jail. He was given a long sentence. He is in a jail that's like uh, in, in a town called Mandera. That's more than, that's almost 400 miles away, about 350 some miles away maybe from, from the setting. Although I'm calling it Las Burgao, it's really Arigabo. He was sent there. So his sister is now alone. She is visiting him for the second time. Now, Remember I told you the cough, remember the cough. There is something about, there is this disease that uh, scientifically is, I, I don't think that's the scientific name, but that's the name in English, tuberculosis. And I always wondered, why tuberculosis? Does it sound like a disease to you, tuberculosis? We call it qahr. By the sound of it, you know it kills. You know it's a killer. <laughs> How about malaria? Malaria. Malaria, does it sound like a disease? It doesn't sound like a disease. It sounds like, a, like the name of a Latina. Malaria. We call it Dumo. Again, by the sound of it, you know it kills. So Amina is consumptive. Amina is ravaged by this disease, tuberculosis that we call Qahu. And she is visiting, and she is extremely weak. And she is visiting her brother for the second time. I believe in nine months, I see it says in the book, I believe. She is visiting him. And she is very, very weak. Nine months later, Amina traveled to the Mandera jail to visit Ali for the second time. The journey took two days of actual travel time, four days in all among people she didn't know. It was a rather grueling trip on a bumpy dirt road. Ali was made to wait by the gate. From afar, she glimpsed, she glimpsed him and pulled herself towards him. He could tell her poise and posture were diminished. Gone was the elegant walk, the noble gait. She walked as if heavy weights held her feet. She fought with all her might to support her feeble legs. And with great effort, she dragged the weighted feet. Not allowed to walk and meet her halfway, he endured the pitiful sight. It was torment for him, but he had to wait. Finally, she arrived and laughed nervously. His arms stretched wide. He took two giant steps towards her. 
she raised both her hands, open palms, turned towards him as if to say, stop. Because of the pain she is feeling inside, you know, and she is afraid he is going to hug her, and, 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 and she is extremely ill. Around her, you wrap his bony arms to embrace her tightly. He doesn't know how much she is aching. But just then, he flinched. And with a sinking heart, let go of her. Her ribs, her ribs, fragile and protruding ribs covered with thin skin. Her rib cage felt as if it might collapse. He stood back and watched her. She was all skin and bone, had skin and bones. He studied her sunken face, her cheeks, caved in. The, recede, the receding gum gave her mouth a beastly look, but the greatest change was in her eyes. Formerly bright and beaming, they now looked hollow, hollow and sallow. She looked at him from head to toe. That's his sister. His sister, her brother only two that remain from the family. For a long time, only the two of them alone. She looked at him from head to toe and smiled, as if to say, I have made it. But it was a faint smile. Her lips parted, stretched sideways, and showed her ghostly teeth. It was a flicker in the eyes, a great achieve achievement. But to hold the smile was a taxing feat. The strain showed on her gawky face. Her lips twitched, twitched from the nervousness. And the smile faded faster than it had come. She coughed, turning away and covering her mouth as she did so. And she began to pant. Her lungs gave a wheezing sound. <laughs> she looked up and faced him to see his eyes and attempted another smile. He watched her in horror. There she stood, chin thrust forward as if to recapture her former vim and vigor. Or to exhort Ali to complete the journey begun so long ago. Then her face relaxed, and her drained eyes gave him that soothing and knowing look of times past. And she knew that he knew, and he knew that she knew that he knew. Then and only then did she manage another smile which survived longer than the one before. So if you want, I can read the final uh, one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not afraid. I, I think most authors do not read the, the ending, but I can read it. But it may have taken a long time.